Okay, as I mentioned, we're not going to necessarily be reading it line by line. I'll try to outline what the chapter says in advance and, um, and then discuss the various components of it, pick out some lines. We'll try to find a com comfortable format and uh, we'll work it out with back and forth. So the book of Yeshua, where and when does it be begin? It, it begins at the, at the very uh, edge of Eretz Yisrael. We're on the opposite side of the Jordan River. This is shortly after the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, exactly where the Torah finishes off. The Haftorah of Simchas Torah, when we complete the Torah, is the book of Yeshua, the book of Joshua. Moshe just died, and the Jewish people are ready now. They're mourning him, and after 30 days, they're ready to enter Israel. So if Moshe died on the 7th of Adar, we're holding here probably towards the beginning of Nis, the Jewish month of Nisan, right there around the, uh, the springtime. Okay, so they're sitting there at the cusp of Israel, Joshua just took the mantle of leadership, and uh, that's where the book begins. So let's get it done. The first verse here, although generally we'll take a quicker pace, the first verse is packed with, with important things. It says as follows, It was after the death of Moshe, the servant of Hashem, that Hashem spoke to Yeshua, who was the attendant of Moshe. Okay? So, on the one hand, it's giving you a time, a time frame. This was after Moshe died, but it's more pronounced than that. It refers to Moshe as the servant of Hashem, the Eved of Hashem. That is an appellation that not many human beings have merited. For, for God, through his prophet, to testify and call you an Eved of Hashem, that means you put all of your, all of your power into it while you were alive. And normally, during one's lifetime, it's hard to call him an Eved of Hashem because you never know where a person's going to end up. So Moshe Rabbeinu merited it. Um, and it's significant that this book has to start after the death of Moshe. It, if it was, which implies, if Moshe was alive, then this story would not be able to unfold. The book stresses in the beginning. It's after the death of Moshe. If he was alive, this story couldn't have taken place. What's the deal there? What's the idea? So the Ralbag explains, Moshe Rabbeinu has the ultimate assistance from God. If Moshe was the one to bring into, into Israel, he would completely eradicate all of the enemies. There were 31 non-Jewish nations living in Israel at the time in the land of Canaan. He would have completely wiped them all out. And Eretz Yisrael would have been completely belonging to the Jewish people. That would have been great. But... The Jewish people didn't merit that. We'll see later in the book of Judges that throughout their history in Israel, in early Israel, they had not finished the job of conquering all of their enemies there. And those enemies were constantly a thorn in their side, coming up to whenever the Jewish uh, um, faith in Hashem would waver, whenever our Amuna would lack, then immediately the enemies would jump upon them. So Hashem needed to keep enemies there as, like a, uh, as, a, as a stick to prod us with. So it couldn't have been Moshe that brought us in, because if Moshe brought us in, there would be no enemies left to utilize laser later as Hashem's, you know, patch to the Jewish people. It had to be Joshua that brought us in, because Joshua, although he was great, he was not on the level of Moshe. And as you'll see, he, he did not succeed in wiping out all of the enemies of, of, his, of Israel. And they ended up having enemies there to leave them behind. So if Moshe had brought us in, this story couldn't have unfolded. Hashem wouldn't have let us in. There's a second, a deeper point here. If Moshe had brought us in, he would have been the one to build the temple. And Moshe is known as the, uh, everything that Moshe gives is netzach. It's eternal, eternal. He gave us the Torah. He brought down the Torah from heaven. The Torah is eternal. It's never going to change and never going to, to waver. If Moshe brought us into Israel and built the temple, the Beis HaMikdash, that would also be eternal. And that sounds like a good thing. What could possibly be wrong with having a permanent structure for a base of Mikdash. It would be problematic if Moshe brought us into Israel and built a temple because the temple would have to be standing forever, which sounds like a good thing, but apparently that's not a good thing. Because if you can't destroy the temple and the Jewish people start misbehaving, then who does Hashem have to take it out on? God forbid he'll have to start hurting his people directly. Therefore, better to have a temporary structure, which if the Jews misbehave, 
then Hashem can take away their building, take away the sticks and the stones of the temple. As painful as that is, it's not nearly as bad as the Jewish people suffering directly. So it's essential that Moshe Rabbeinu is not the one to build the temple because Hashem foresaw that the Jewish people would end up falling on their spiritual level. And he wanted to have the backup plan of destroying the base of Mikdash rather than destroying the Jewish people. It's a profound point, almost as if the lower level was necessary as a benefit to us. Okay, that's the opening line of Acharei Mot. It had to be after the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. And now to introduce our main character of the story is Yeshua. Yeshua here is described as Meshares Moshe, the attendant or the one who served Moshe. Here in the art school, what are they translated? Uh, Moses' attendant. Yeah, the attendant. This implies that right, Yeshua probably did a lot of things in his lifetime. Maybe he had a day job and he was, he was probably quite wise. The one title that you give him, introducing the book that's named after him, is The Attendant of Moshe. The Gaon says, the Gaon of Vilna says, this is teaching us that the reason Yeshua merited to, be, to take over the leadership is because of this thing that he was the attendant of Moshe. Moshe is Rabbeinu. Everybody learned from Moshe. But Yeshua specifically is the one who tended to him and to all of his needs. And the Talmud says in, some, in, in the Brachos, Gadol Shimusha, Yoser Milimuda. It is greater to be an attendant to a Torah scholar right. than to learn the Torah itself. Which is remarkable. You, you think learning is like the highest honor. It's better to be an attendant to a Torah scholar than to learn the Torah itself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard that before. What do you think the idea is? Why do you think Gadol Shimusha, Yoser Milimuda? What's the benefit of being an attendant, of tending to Torah scholars? Washing their hands is the example the Gemara gives. Um, Yeshua, in our case, would be the one to organize the base medrash after everybody left. He would make sure yeah, that the place was clean and ready for the next day. How is that greater than learning? What did you say? He's a shamash. He was a shamash, yeah. He's basically a shamash. He's Moshe shamash, right? He was the one who would make the appointment book, people waiting online in the Oel Moed. Okay, you want to see Moshe? Come this way. Uh, he made sure that uh, all the maintenance guys were doing what they needed to do. Well, how could that be greater than learning? And it's not just greater than learning, but that's why Yeshua merited being the Yeshua of the book of Yeshua. How could that be? Anybody have any insights to that? It enables everyone else to learn better. Very nice. Beautiful. Spoken to a man who's a, a you know, right? enabling other people to, to do their job more efficiently. So it's not just your own merit of learning. It's now you've enabled the myriads to learn. Beautiful idea. Also, if, you, um, if you're if you assisting someone, you're a part of their everyday life and you're a witness to everything they do. And so they're an example. It, you're actually living it rather than learning it. Like you're learning by their example. Beautiful, excellent. That is actually what I have here in my notes from the Maharaj Chius, who quoted the Gona Vilna. He said, to see the Torah alive is much more impactful and much more memorable than to keep it in the abstract. So here we are learning Torah, which is one of the, the greatest things the human can be engaged in, learning the word of God. But it's still abstract. To actually follow around a Torah scholar and a Talmud Chacham, you see how he embodied it, how all of that filtered and, and manifests itself in the physical world. The way he fills up gas in his car, the way he hashes, washes his hands, the way he keeps his home organized etc. Those are the living Torah. And in that sense, it's more memorable. You'll remember it better. And you'll also be able to really clarify the, the lessons of Torah when you have a vivid 3D image, uh, a life image in front of you, of somebody who keeps the Torah. So Yeshua was the ultimate attendant of Moshe. He was the one who stood by him no matter what. When Moshe was up on Har Sinai, all of the Jewish people were camped at the base of the mountain. But Joshua was a little bit separated from them, just waiting. Just waiting, like a, almost like a, you know, like a, like a dog. Yeah, I hate to say, right? But you know, like a faithful, a faithful servant, just waiting at the ready. What is my teacher going to do when he's going to come down? When can I, when can I serve him? I think that one of the ideas is also there's an interesting um, piece of Gemara in Baba Kama. A certain rabbi wanted to get the answer to one of his questions in in, in halacha, so he went to 
I believe it was Rami Bar Kham, one of the scholars, and he said, I heard that you know, I heard that you know the answer to this question. Can you please teach me? So Rami Bar Kham responded to him, I'm happy to teach you, but first, I want you to fold my scarf. He took off his uh, scarf, his sudar, hands it to the rabbi. The rabbi folds it and gives it back. He says, okay, now I'll tell you the halacha that you wanted to hear. And he goes on and he, and he informs him. I said, what a strange thing. You, you couldn't fold your own scarf and suddenly want now the, the scholar to do it. The idea is when you want to uh, bestow someone on somebody else, when you're trying to, when there's a teacher-student relationship, there has to be a slope. There has to be that one is elevated above the other so that you know, the water can roll down. You want the lessons to flow down to the student. So you have to establish a sort of a hierarchy. So Rami Bar Khama said, I'm ready to teach you, but I don't think it's gonna go in. First, let's establish that you are, you're willing to submit yourself to my teaching. Fold my scarf. And in that way, I'll enable the Torah to flow down into you easier and deeper. So Yeshua was the ultimate, so to speak, scarf folder. Since he attended to Moshe so much and so devotedly, that created that slope, which enabled him to get so much more of the impact of Moshe Rabbeinu, more than any other people in his generation. So that's why this is the most important and essential introduction you can give to Yeshua himself, the person Yeshua, is the fact that he was Mesharet Moshe. Through this, as we said, you enable other people to learn. That's what the, uh, Moshe Katz said. Mrs. Kramer quoted the Marat Chius, who says that through Shimush, you're able to see a living example of the Torah. And finally, we have this idea that through serving somebody, you're making yourself below them, and therefore now you're able to understand them. It just occurred to me that that kind of works in English, right? When you understand someone, I've heard this, these words before, you stand under them. But in this case, right, that's really the idea. By folding his scarf, by attending to the person, you become subservient to them in a sense, and now enable their lessons to penetrate even deeper. That is why this is a critical introduction to Yeshua himself. Okay, now in the opening, in the rest of the opening of the chapter, we have Hashem speaking to Yeshua. Yeshua was a prophet. And he promises to give the land. Everywhere you step, I will give you. you will, the, the land will be yours. Let's, let's, uh, this is verse three. Every place upon which the sole of your foot will march, I have given to you. And then in verse four, it goes on to delineate the boundaries of Israel. From the desert, in uh, Lebanon, all the way to the, to the Great River, etc., etc. So we have here seemingly two different coordinates. On the one hand, he's giving us the boundaries of Israel. On the other hand, he's saying, anywhere you step will belong to you. These are actually two different ideas. The second one is clear. The boundaries of Israel, Hashem has given to us. That's the land of Israel, the biblical boundaries of Israel. That belongs to the Jewish people because God said so. But beyond that, there's an ability to expand the boundary. Everywhere your foot steps, this is talking about kibush milchama. If the after conquering Israel, if the Sanhedrin, if the Jewish courts would come together and decide they want to expand the border, they can now engage in military action to expand their borders. We are we like we uh, we're not such fans of war, you know, in our day and age. Back then, that's that was quite a common thing, and that was a valid way to extend expand the borders of Israel. This is not just you know, how to draw the map, but this has significant ramifications in terms of there's certain laws that only apply in Israel, Meiser and Shemitah and those things. So if theoretically the Jews wanted to expand you know, outwards towards Eilat or beneath that, that would make it halachic Israel if they were to conquer it as an army after, again, conquering Israel. So that's the idea here. Not only will I give you the borders of Israel, but also you can expand it uh, through war. Um, and then Hashem says, and you'll find this theme throughout. Chazak ve'emas. You should be strong and uh, stout-hearted. Strong and stout-hearted. And three times he tells him, Chazak ve'emas. Chazak ve'emas. He keeps strengthening Yeshua and telling him you should be strong. You should be strong. As if Yeshua needed extra re reinforcements, extra reassurance. And soon we'll even find that the tribes are telling him, Yeshua, we're going to listen to what you're doing, but just make sure you're strong. Don't waver. They had like some sort of uh, inferiority complex. Like what's going on here? Well, how come he has to keep getting reinforcements? So the Mepharshim actually explained, the commentaries explained that indeed Yeshua was one of the giants, right? One of the greatest people to ever live. But he had 
the fortunate pleasure of succeeding Moshe Rabbeinu, no one greater than him in the history of the world. So as great as you are, you will forever be in the shadow of your teacher. And the, the Gemara even describes how the elders of the generation would constantly be comparing Joshua to Moshe. And they'd say Moshe is like the sun. He's, you know, shining and powerful. But Joshua is like the moon. He's only, you know, he's only able to reflect what he got. He's not, he's not as, they, they recognize there's a difference and they were correct. But therefore Yeshua needed constant chizuk and reinforcement to enable him to do his task. And in fact, when they decided to inaugurate Yeshua, it had to be done in the lifetime of Moshe. Moshe, they made it a public affair. They gathered everybody around and they said, look, Moshe is now placing his hands upon Yeshua to confer upon him the, you know, the mantle of leadership. It had to be done in front of anyone. Otherwise, in front of everyone. Otherwise, nobody would accept him, right? If Moshe dies and Yeshua comes the next day and says, hey guys, I'm the guy in charge. I'll say, who are you? You're nowhere, nobody compared to Moshe. It had to be done in a public setting where everybody could see that Moshe is here and Yeshua is here and the leadership is transferred. There's an, right? So that's one reason why Yeshua needs chizuk. If you read more uh, carefully, you'll notice that he gives him chizuk, he gives him uh, strength and reassurance in three different areas. And this is a, a very fascinating point that I heard from Rabbi Yitzchak Lichtenstein. I found fantastic uh, shiurim from him when I was preparing. He says as following, is as follows. Uh, in verse six, strengthen yourself because you'll cause these people to inherit the land. So I'll give you strength in the inheritance of the land. That requires strength because if it's time to like hand out the candy to the kids, Right? This one says, I want the blue one, I want the red one, I want the green one, I want that one. So imagine now apportioning the land to the entire Jewish people that they're going to have forevermore. I want the mountains. No, I want to be by the beach. No, I want the, the desert. There's going to be such arguments. You need strength in that area. So I'm I giving you strength in, in being the leader to be able to, to apportion, to divvy out the land without people uh, coming back and, and fighting against you. Furthermore, in verse 7, Oh, that you will strengthen yourself and, and persevere in order to observe and, and keep the Torah and learn the Torah. So the second area he needs strengthening is the learning and keeping of the Torah. Don't stop learning Torah. This is your merit. You're about to go fight many wars, but you should know that the engine, which will be, which will be fueling the entire thing, powering the entire operation, is your commitment to the Torah. Stay close to me and I will take care of you. It's not about military uh, exercises, but spiritual exercise. Make sure you stay close to the Torah. So why is it, why is it brought out three times, you said? Chazak v'yamatz. That's only one. Right. So the first one is Chazak v'yamatz regarding inheriting the land. To divvy out the land, you need chizuk. The second thing that needs chizuk is the learning of Torah. And the third thing that needs chizuk it will be in verse number... Uh, Nine, verse number nine, strengthen yourself and do not fear from the enemy. The third thing that needs chizuk is the war. He needs chizuk in divvying out the land, in keeping to the Torah, and in winning the war against the 31 kings of Israel. These reflect three different roles that Yeshua played for the Jewish people at the time. And this is a fascinating point. Yeshua was the leader, which means he was in charge of the Jewish people. That's divvying out the land. Make sure you can be the leader without anybody trying to oppose your decisions. When you gave Zvul on the beachfront properties, no one should argue with you. I'm going to give you chizuk. That's number one. Number two, you need chizuk in Torah because you are the head of the Sanhedrin. You are the head of the halachic court, which, makes the, which issues the ruling to the Jewish people. So stay close to the Torah because you need to have knowledge of the Torah and commitment to the Torah. He was a manhig, a leader, the head of the Sanhedrin, and thirdly, although it was informally, he was acting as the king. There's no official coronation, but he was the melech as well. And it's the, he, since there was nobody had the official job, it was his. The leader of the Sanhedrin at that time would also play the role as king. He's the one who initiates the wars. And therefore, he needed a chizuk in going to war. Right? So these three uh, st strengthenings that Hashem is giving him is corresponding to his three different tasks. He's the leader of the nation. He is the head of the... Sanhedrin, and he is the head of the army, the king, right? the commander in chief. Okay, that's the three chizuk that he gets. Okay. 
let's uh, let's move on a little bit. So now Yeshua in verse uh, in verse ten it says Yeshua commands the leaders of the nation get ready. We're leaving in three days. This is exactly thirty days after Moshe Rabbeinu's death. For those thirty days, the entire since Moshe died, when the Torah ends, the seventh of Adar, the entire nation was in mourning, national mourning for an entire month. Just like when a person loses, God forbid, his relative, there's the Shiva, the seven days, and then there's the Shloshim, the 30 days. So the entire Jewish people, since they had lost their leader, they were all in mourning for 30 days. They had the Shloshim. So until then, nobody moved. But it was after the Shloshim of Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshua stood up and said, okay, we have three days, prepare yourselves, and then we're going to go into, and, and, and cross the Jordan River and enter Israel. So interestingly enough, he tells them, prepare for yourself provisions. So normally that makes sense. You're about to go into Israel, you know, you're going to undertake military action, make sure you have provisions, enough food to sustain you while you're fighting wars. The problem is we have a tradition that the Jews were still subsisting on manna. They were still getting the man that was falling to them in the desert. Either, either the man had continued to fall even after Moshe's death on a daily basis, or the man that fell right before Moshe's death, it stayed and lasted for them for 30 days, and it stayed fresh. So why did they need to prepare any food? You have manna with you. So there are various approaches there. But the manna lasted for, for um, until the 16th of Nisan. Right? And the man lasts until the 16th of Nisan. Right, okay. Which is basically a, a month and, and, uh, and uh, a little more than a week after Moshe died. So why did they have to prepare any food? So either they had to prepare the man itself, maybe grind it down and put it into you know, containers that they could take it with them on the go. Or this means prepare yourselves weapons. Make sure you take weapons with you because you're about to go fight. Okay, that's what the preparation here is. Just an interesting note about the, the manna. Where did you get the, um, the date that the man stopped coming? We'll see it. We'll see it uh, later in the book. Uh, it, it comes in chapter maybe three or four. We'll see it later on. It's, it's explicit in the verse. The truth is, it's from there that we, we learn when Moshe Rabbeinu died. We work backwards to figure it out. Okay, when, uh, we'll come across it soon. I forget the exact verse, but it comes from later on in the book of, of Joshua. Um, okay, now in verses 12 to 18, Yeshua now turns to address the tribes of Reuben and God. Reuben and God were now camped on the opposite side of the Jordan. And Yeshua <laughs> says to them, remember your deal with Moshe Rabbeinu. These two tribes had lots of cattle. And when after they conquered the, the nations of Sichon and Og, they said, you know what? This place suits us. This is good for us. We want to stay here. And we're opting out of the whole Israel thing. This is in Parshas Matos at the end of the book of Amidbar, the end of the book of Numbers. And Moshe says to them, well, you're just going to abandon ship We're right here at the cusp of Israel and you're leaving. They said, no, no, we'll make a condition. And they made a condition with Moshe. We will go in. We'll leave our women and cattle behind. But the fighters of our tribes will go into Israel. We'll spend as long as it takes fighting with our brethren. And then we will return. Initially, Moshe demanded only that they stay until the end of the war. But they said, not only will we stay till the end of the war, we will even stay until all of the land is divvied out and everyone is finally home. They all moved into their new places. Then we'll go back to the other side of the Arden. And you know how long that lasted for? The wars were seven years long and the actual divvying out of the land took another seven years. So you're talking about 14 years that the tribes, the men of Reuben and God, the fighters, military aged men were not back home. 14 years, it's a significant amount of time. Um, so they kept, and they indeed kept to their promise. So Yeshua turns to them and he says to them, listen, you said you're going to go ahead. So make sure you do that. Uh, it's not only that they, that they went and joined the Jewish people, but it says they should be chalutzim. I wonder how they translate it here in the English. Pardon me. Uh, 
Okay, I cannot find it here. Perhaps it's in, uh, in Matas. They should be chalutzim, which means not only do they go and join their brethren in war, but they have to be on the front lines. The stronger ones amongst them committed themselves. We're not just going to go and join. You know, we're we're going to be right in the front. We're going to be in, in, down in the dirty, in the, in the trenches with them. To show solidarity, to show that we're not starting our own nation across the, the, the Jordan River. We're just we just want to do what we need to do on the opposite side of the river, but we're still part of the nation. Okay. Verse, verse 14 says, uh, cross over armed before your brothers. Very good, yes. Before your brothers. Very nice. That's a good allusion. The, to it. JPS, the JPS translation of Chalutzim is, um, is uh, sorry, I just lost it. Uh, shock troops. What is that? That's that they, they go in first to shock. Right. Does it say Chalutzim here or is that in, in the it's in it's in it's in Dvarim. In Dvarim, okay. In Dvarim. Very good. Yes. Very good. So Rav um Rav Yitzchak Lichtenstein, I, I had just heard a few moments and I heard this point. The word chalutz we find in a few different contexts. Here it means shock troops, is that what you said? Shock troops. Anybody else where we have know where we have such a, a root? Does the word chal, chalutz sound familiar to you? How about hachlitzenu? Ritzev hachalitzenu? No, those words sound familiar to you? In the benching of Shabbos, we say, Hashem, may you, may you be cholets us. So what are we asking God to do? To come in as a shock troop? What is that? What does our resting on Shabbos have to do with, with the right? And a third place we see it is the mitzvah of chalitza. Anybody, right? Chalitza is when. In the uh, leveret marriage, if when one brother dies without any children, so the sister-in-law has a mitzvah to to um, excuse me, the almana, the widow has a mitzvah to marry his brother, and if she does, if the, he wants to opt out, then she does chalitza, she removes his shoe. So what's the connection between going to the front lines of war, asking Hashem to give us rest on Shabbos, and removing a shoe from somebody's foot? It's all the same word, chalas, same Jewish root. So he shared from his father, or was it his grandfather, that uh, it all is the idea of relieving pressure. When you remove a shoe from a foot, it relieves the pressure on the foot. When we go to the front lines of the, ar of the war, those soldiers are relieving pressure from the rest of the army, right? You're, you're, you're taking off the initial load. There's the shock trip. You're taking off the load for the rest of the fighters. So it's a relief of pressure. And on Shabbos, we say, when you, may you relieve us of all of the regular pressures that, that may uh, afflict us during the week, please, Hashem, give us a little bit of more, more space to breathe on Shabbat. It's all the same idea of, uh, just to show you the beauty of the Jewish language, it's not arbitrary, right? It's a release. Same idea, what'd you say? Yeah, in a sense, it's a release. Release, right. I guess, yeah, releasing, releasing uh, pressure, releasing from, from confines, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so they agree. Of course, we will... Of course, we'll go to the front lines with you. And they give them an interesting condition. They say, we'll do everything for you as long as rock, rock. They say to him, just, yeah, uh, as long as we see that God is with you as he was with Moshe. Meaning, we'll, we'll follow you as long as we see that the divine presence is with you. And it, it kind of is giving you a look behind the scenes of uh, people comparing Yeshua to Moshe. And, and the, the general, perhaps there was a general nervousness. Reuben is saying, we're, we're in with you. Yeshua will do everything for you. We're committed to you. We're on your side. They're giving him this chizuk. As long as you're staying on the straight and narrow, and you don't back down from anyone, if anyone rebels against you, Rashi says, we want you to take them to justice. Don't be overly humble and forgo your honor. As long as you play your role, we'll, we'll play our role and go above and beyond for our brethren. Okay? And, uh, and then we have uh, the episode of sending in spies. So if you're still following around the blue chumash, we're going to switch now to the aftora of Shlach, and we'll just uh, we'll wrap it up over here. Just I want I want to just see this introduce this last episode. Yeshua sends in two spies. It's on page 1184 in the Stone Chumash. It happens to be the second chapter of Yeshua. If you don't have a book of Joshua, that's another place. 1184 in the blue chumash. Yeshua sends shnei anashim shnei He sends two spies. Cheresh. Heresh means silently. So this could mean one of three things. He sent in spies silently. He didn't tell 
the Radak says, you didn't tell the other Jews about this. Because the last time they sent spies, he happened to be one of them, didn't go so well. People got really nervous. Is it a good land? Is it good for us? He didn't want any repeats. This was a very practical thing. He just wanted to send two spies to gather particular information. So either it means be quiet about the actual mission. Don't tell the other Jews. The second thing that, that it could mean is they pretended that they were cheresh, which means deaf. They walked into Israel as if they were deaf people. What's the benefit of that? Because now no one's going to be concerned about speaking around them. They're trying to gather information about the locals. So if they're just a deaf person, no one's going to mind speaking in front of them. Right? There's, there's no uh, eavesdropping. So pretend you're deaf. And the third approach is Rashi brings, it's actually you could switch the shin to a sin or like a samech sound, and it's cheres to pretend you're selling pottery. Because you have to explain, you have to have some alibi. Uh, what are you doing over here? You're just a bunch of strangers coming into town, into Jericho, to figure out what's going on. No, we're selling pottery. We're just a bunch of merchants. Pretend you're selling pottery. Okay? Could be you could put all three together, right? They were deaf merchants and uh, they, they kept it quiet from the nation. But this is the general idea. They're going there on a reconnaissance mission. But as we'll see, what ends up happening is they go and stay in the inn of this lady called Rachav Hazona. And then the king of Jericho hears that they're there. And so they run for it. They make an, a deal with Rachav. You know, you protected us. We'll protect you and your family as long as you don't tell about our secrets. And, uh, and they make a run for it. And they go back to Joshua. So like, what a failure of a mission, isn't it? The answer is not. Their, their mission in this, in this uh, spy operation was not to gather information about the lion and not about attacking. All they wanted to do was bolster the morale of the people. They wanted to go in, into Jericho, and listen to the general tone of the locals. How are they feeling about those Jews who are, uh, you know, a couple of uh, miles down yonder? And they walk in there and they hear that everyone is just terrified. They, they, these Jews are crazy. They just destroyed Sichon and Og, the two giants that lived opposite the Jordan. And now we remember what happened when they left Egypt. This God, their God is with them. We're all doomed. Our hearts are melted. He said, ah, perfect. They go back to Joshua and they relate this information to the people. The idea was we wanted to bolster their morale. The, uh, Yeshua was trying to give the people confidence, right? Opposite what happened with the spies of the Chumash. He wanted to give the people confidence. Look, look how Hashem is with you. Your enemies are melting before you, even before you even walk in there. They're terrified of you. So these guys go to a place, uh, the inn of Rachav Hazona. So who was this lady, Rachav Hazona? The name Rachav means a uh, wide. Rachav, Rachav is wit. This, the Malbim explains that means she was a very well-known person. Everyone, it was, let's say it was a very popular inn. If it means innkeeper, then she was a very well-known person. Everybody passed through. So she would get lots of information from lots of different people. So rather than having to scout out multiple areas, just go to one location where you can gather the maximum amount of information. Secondly, she was a zona. Her profession was a zona. This could mean one of two things. The zona could mean mazon, which means sustenance. She served food to people, like an innkeeper. Alternatively, it could mean just she was a prostitute. And the significance of that is the spies were trying to hide their identity by going specifically to a house of a prostitute. Because the, the Malbim explains the non-Jews knew that those Jews despise, despise immorality. It can't be that these are Jewish spies if they're in the house of Rachav Azona. That's one of the, uh, one of the ideas. Ends up, uh, as, even, even if that was her profession, she ends up doing them quite a big favor, right? Because the king hears that they're coming and he sends people to chase them. But, so they go to Rachav and they say, you know, give up the men that they're staying by you. They're Jewish spies. She says, huh? Oh, they just left. You know, you better go chase them out to the gate. And so the, the soldiers of the king go running out. And Rachav, in the meantime, takes the two spies and hides them up on her roof. And she says, please promise me when you come in and destroy our people that you'll protect me and my family. So they say, no problem. They take that red string and tie it on your, on your uh, window. She lived on the wall of Jericho. So take that red string and we'll make sure not to, not to attack you there. And they said, just make sure you don't tell anybody, anybody about this. Why can't she tell about the swear? What's the big deal? The, the idea is, if, uh, if they've swore to protect her and her family, then anybody is going to want to get in on this deal. So everyone's going to start marrying into the Rachav family. They're going to have a huge uh, family reunion, and they're going to discover all these relatives they never had, 
and the whole city of Jericho was going to basically come under the umbrella of Rachav and say, hey, sorry, you made a swear not to harm us. So they made a promise. Don't tell anybody about our swear. We don't want anybody in, you know, we don't want anybody coming into this deal after the fact. We're promising to you and your immediate family, and that's it. Okay, and so she stays faithful, faithful to them, and uh, she sneaks them out in the dead of night, and, and they run out. Okay. Um, why did they specifically go to Jericho? Uh, Jericho was the most fortified city of, of the area. It had, it had, it was on the border, and therefore it had to be extra fortified. It had tremendous walls, and uh, the famous story of how it came down. We'll learn about God willing in the future. Okay, so this is just, this is the, uh, we've got our foot in the door, so to speak, and the next week we'll uh, continue God willing with the story of Yeshua. Okay, so tonight we discussed, we discussed the uh, essence of Yeshua, the fact that he was the attendant of Moshe. That's what made him merit his position. The fact that he served Moshe was his greatest accolade. This story had, the second thing we discussed was this story had to take place after the death of Moshe. Because if Moshe would take the Jewish people into Israel, all the enemies would be destroyed. There'd be nobody left to serve as a beating rod for the Jewish people. And second, it would be impossible to destroy the temple, which actually is detrimental to the Jews. I'm just reviewing. Then we spoke about the chizuk that Hashem had to give Yeshua because he was living in the shadows of Moshe, constantly being compared to his illustrious uh, uh, predecessor. And, and then we learned that there's three different types of chizik he had to get, because he was at once a leader, he was the, the head of the Sanhedrin, and he was the king, the head of the army. So he had to get chizik in divvying out the land and acting as leader. He had to get chizik in Torah, in learning Torah and keeping it. And he had to get chizik in actually not being afraid of the war, and as, as far as his role as, as a king. Then we discussed the interaction with Reuben and God, you know, the, the dating, uh, which, which is rooted in the Torah, obviously, in the Parsha of Matos, and again, in the book of Devarim. And we went on to the story of uh, Rachel Azona and the spies. Uh, we distinguished between this spy mission and the spy mission in the Torah. Spy mission in the Torah, they were nervous. They're trying to figure out how we're going to fight them. Here, it was just to bolster their morale and show them, look, Hashem has already given it to you. And we discussed the identity of Rachel Azona. Just an interesting uh, factoid to end off the night. This lady, Rachel Azona, she ends up becoming a very important lady. Uh, do you know who she married? Joshua. Uh, Joshua. She marrying, yeah, she ends up marrying Joshua. Very remarkable. Yeah. So, uh, talk about making a turnaround. Um, she ended up converting to Judaism. He married. Her. Yeah. Is that in? Is that in the book? It's Joshua? not explicit in the book. It's part of our oral tradition. Right. I, yeah. I have a concern here. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in verse two, it says, uh, "And the king was told." that the men came there that night to search out the land. So when the, when the men crossed over to Jordan and to Jericho and they got through, who, how, and they, and the king knew exactly where they went. Yeah. Which is actually what we call very poor OPSEC. Yeah. Um, they must have had good intelligence, right? So uh, first we have to re realize that the, the the, na the nations were anticipating an infiltration by the Jews. Right? They knew that the Jews were camped there and they knew that they were headed to Israel. This was the, this was the greatest news in, that, <laughs> in the history of the world. Everybody knew. Uh, so the Malbim actually said, in the verse, it's, it says he, he says it alludes to how the king found out. Because they came, Hina Anashim Ba'u Hena. Men came here. Who comes to Jericho to sell your pots and pans? You don't come into the city. You're coming to the most fortified city to, to be a merchant, very suspicious. You know, go to the open marketplace, go somewhere a little bit more available. Also, they came tonight. Nighttime is not a time to travel. Right. Even a regular traveler doesn't travel at night, let alone a salesman. That's not a good time to find people to buy your product. So that's how they knew it was Nibne Israel. So it must be this is a Jew because they suspected something. Right? Could be they didn't know for sure, but they suspected something. You have these strange guys we've never seen before. Okay, they're holding pottery, they might be deaf. But they're traveling at night, and they happen to be coming to our most uh, power, strategic military spot in the land. Uh, we got to be suspicious here. See here? That's the Malbim's insight on that verse. So, on, as much as they tried to hide themselves, uh, they were foiled. Yeah. All right. Any other um, insights or comments out there? Key. I appreciate 
Uh, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. I thought I gave the Zoom option so people enjoy, you know, people like. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Can't live with it, can't live without it. That's, uh... Thanks a lot for sticking around. Uh... God willing, yeah. Mr. Shalvi, you out there? Oh, there you go. Thanks for coming, Moshe. Have a good night.